Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of It's Going to Be Alright. My name is Niklas Smitrovic. And I am Clayton Gwen. And today we're going to talk about jargon. Jargon. I like that the the word that we use to explain incredibly specialized language is also so specialized. It is very strange. Ja- and I jargon. I had to actually look look up the um, the the history of the word where it comes from and I was a little bit lazy so I just ended up um looking at wikipedia oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but th- th- still interesting and it might still be uh correct i mean it's not like everything on wikipedia is uh it's just uh fake <laughs> fake news <laughs> no and well i mean i always tell people that um you know wikipedia has changed a lot in you know the the uh, how long has it been now like 10 or or 15 years that it is being around that, sure, I still wouldn't use it as a citation in a research paper, but it's a really great place to go and get kind of your basic starter information. And always, you know, take it with a grain of salt and and triangulate it with a bit of other information from the internet. But a lot of content in there is actually quite good to give you that that general overview. So I ended up there yeah. myself and of course usually places like uh, dictionary.com or um, mm. Webster's Dictionary or the Oxford English Dictionary. I, I kind of pop into those sites often too. But you should definitely not underestimate the, the power of, um, what do you call it, crowd crowdsourcing? Yeah. That's what it is, right? More or less. Crowdsourcing of information, more or less. So... Um, but yeah, I think this is a good starting point. I, I read that it's a French word, which believed to have been derived from the Latin word gagir, meaning to chatter, yeah. which was used to describe speech that the listener did not understand. That's one uh, expl- explanation. Another one is that it may come from Old French jargon, meaning chatter of birds. Twittering. Or twittering, basically. Or the Middle English also has the verb... Jargunen, meaning to chatter or twittering, mm-hmm. deriving from Old French. So, yeah. Which is what... the evolution of language there that we think, you know, to chat is to have like something friendly and, and informal um, that's quite accessible, you know, like small talk is a form of, or mm-hmm. chit chat, as we might say. Mm-hmm. So it's it's interesting to see how, you know, things have kind of evolved from, you know, where that kind of terminology to chatter meant to be highly specialized in a way that sort of excluded many potential listeners to something that, oh, anybody can participate in chit-chat. It's just whether or not you care to. Yeah, because, I mean, small talk and chit-chat, at least in Norway, it's usually about the weather, and that's something that most people can be a part of. But but in this context, it's more like an, a conversation that excludes other people yeah. because it uses words or, or talks about something that is uh, unfamiliar to most people. And I th- so I would say a lot mm-hmm. of people think that jargon is sort of specific terminology, like specific words. But I think that we could probably extend it to also understand that it's sort of... Um, a communication style. It's not it is. it's not just about using highly specialized words or concepts. It's also about having um, expressions or forms of written or spoken communication that are, I would probably say, incredibly dense, um, full of a sort of like you know, quote unquote in jokes that if you're oh, lots lots of in yeah, jokes. If you're not in, you don't get it. Listen to this one. This is, I mean, I've been doing some workshops where I've been talking about clarity and academic writing. And and a part of that has been just explaining what jargon is and then how it differs from technical terms and so on. Uh, But this is one example that I I usually take. And do you know what to jam a fist means? I do because I've climbed. Exactly, it's it's a it's from climbing, but it sounds it can sound like a lot of different things, uh, <laughs> but it's what it basically means is to put your hand into a crack in in the mountain, and then you make your hand into a fist so it gets stuck in the crack, and then you can climb. So you just do that all the time, 
in a in a system of cracks up a mountainside, up a hillside, and and that's it. You're at the top if you if you do it correct. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. And so this type of jargon, this specialized technical language is really designed to help improve um, efficiency and communication between people within that type of group. So Yeah, because some, some guy could like shout to you, oh, I, I can't get this hole to work out. You need to jam it. All right. Okay. Yeah, Instead you of get like it. Right. Doing, 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 explaining the concept of... You need of, to of... take your hand and push it inside of the crevice that is there and ball your hand then, up into uh, a fist in order to get yourself stuck in there. And then do like a 45 degree twist and it's like, I mean, that would just yeah. get too much uh, too much information for that so, specific situation. So I would say that you could think of jargon then as uh, it, it has both pros and cons, but jargon would maybe be a good overarching term for these sorts of technical terms, which are mm. incredibly useful because they can be very loaded. Um, and And when you have these loaded terms, it's very difficult to have a plain, simple... Uh, language equivalent. So one that I had brought up from a podcast I was listening to earlier this week is conformal cyclic cosmology. Yeah, now, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, that there is a technical term in astrophysics, and the plain language equivalent is the following. It's the idea that in the distant future, when the universe has expanded to an unthinkably large size and all forms of matter as we know it have decayed essentially into massless particles, the state of that universe will be identical to the state uh, that the Big Bang was in before the Big Bang. And so therefore the conditions are more or less um, indefinitely present to repeat itself. So the universe sort of is born and reborn in this cyclic nature. So conformal cyclic cosmology is a really easy way to distill all of that information into jargon or into a technical term that it, for people who are within it, they understand what it means. And it's and it's necessary, to be honest. If you want to have a, a conversation about that topic, then you have to to make some kind of a technical term yeah. like that. So it's this, <laughs> this shared terminology that uh, really helps people who are within it to clearly communicate ideas and understanding and share meaning. But the problem is that when it, it when it gets really obscure, so um, it might be a term or a or concept that has a relatively vague meaning, or the meaning can be very vague. Mm-hmm. That's when you get when it gets problematic. Yeah, that people that, you know have a different understanding of what this means, so the conversation just gets really bizarre very quickly. Exactly, its interpretation can can come in many different forms. So you actually end up producing jargon or or technical terms that could be theories or concepts related to theories which are heavily debated and don't have a shared meaning. And this is where you get kind of, yeah, abstract jargon. And so this, Mm. I think that uh, when you use jargon, you always need to consider like, what is the cost of using it? Uh, Because jargon is always going to be something that's a bit incomprehensible or inaccessible to people who are unfamiliar with it. So, of course, one of the ways that you can ease this when you're presenting scientific writing is introduce the technical term and either give a definition to it or give a very clear example of it side by side. And then you can continuously use that term because it's been defined, it's been explained, and people have an understanding of of what it is. Um, So you can really quickly bring people into the fold of the more like technical language use of jargon. But I think you get this other problem where you encounter what you said, these situations of sort of meaninglessness, that (laughs) there's not an an agreed upon meaning for a concept, and then it just kind of becomes jargon for jargon's sake. It can sometimes feel like that, but I just want to backtrack a little bit. We talked about the difference between jargon and technical terms, and I, before we started this podcast, we talked a little bit about skateboarding, because you still skateboard, I used to skateboard, um... And there, I think we can um, make a pretty good distinction between what we could call technical terms. That could be names for tricks, Mm -hmm. like 360 flip or kickflip. But then you also have jargon, which could be pet names for tricks, or it could be just a phenomenon within skateboarding. 
or just like a, something that you could do? I mean, you're a little bit more into this than me at this point. Yeah, so but, you could say, yeah, man, go, uh, go do a kickflip. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, if somebody said, hey, can you do one of those magic flips? I mean, if you if you're into <laughs> skateboarding, you would understand that that was like the original name for a kickflip. Uh, and sometimes you get like these really weird situations where you're kind of calling the same thing different names because it's a little bit more colloquial, like based in um, based in the culture of where you're from. So jargon also encompasses a lot of things like slang and colloquial expressions in a way. It is. I mean, I remember 360 flip. We didn't call it 360 flip. We always called it tray. The tray flip. Do, or, or just a yeah. tray. Yeah, just do a tray. Yeah. Or, or same if you did something switch, like uh, just standing the opposite way that you usually stand when you're on a skateboard and do tricks that way. Um, we just call that Swiss. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So it would be a Swiss tray, would be a switch 360 flip. Yeah, uh, or something like um, a body varial where you would ollie, move the board up into the air, engage mm -hmm. a kickflip, uh, where the board will then flip on its horizontal its own. axis, and then mm -hmm. you spin your body uh, 180 degrees. Uh, so you land then the opposite way that you had started the trick, but the board stays in the same position. It doesn't. It it only spins on one axis and not. Uh, You're not talking about sex change. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like you could call it a body burial, or you could call it a sex change. <laughs> yeah. Right. We called it body burial, and and I think we learned. The word, the word sex change uh, through Tony Hawk Pro yeah. Skater? Yeah. I think. And so, like, there's a way that this sort of slang and colloquial phrases can almost become unified in a way because there's something that reaches a, a wider audience and you can agree upon it having that sort of name. And, yeah, like, then you kind of get used to being able to call it either you hear both terms, a body burial or a sex change, and you know it's the same mm. thing. But we we also have like let's say that the names for the tricks are, are technical terms and their pet names would be something it would be more like jargon. But then you also have these phenomenons within skateboarding. Like I remember, can you remember the um, uh, Baker team, Baker Skateboards team? Roughly, but I mean I haven't followed them in quite a while, so I'm probably still stuck in like the late '90s, early 2000s. Yeah, but then then you should know about this because. Uh, they had like a term they called mob that you could mob a trick which would basically mean doing a trick really bad mm. like if you do a mob kick flip it would be you wouldn't be able to level the board the board in the air it would just be like pointing upwards like a really bad kick flip yeah or you know <laughs> or i was i was really familiar with the term crop dusting crop dusting okay, with, I haven't told and, that and that's where you don't you do a trick, but you the trick is done so poorly because you don't properly pop the board. And that's, oh, yeah, that's yeah. where <laughs> you, you don't engage like the full potential of the board's rebound when you, when you ollie. So um, yeah, you can end up kind of crop dusting things where you, do, you do the trick, but you don't do it very well. It doesn't look very good and you don't go very high. It's sort of just An like this low flying approach. It's just an interesting thing. Uh, I mean, every skateboarder has encountered this multiple times, and that's getting a small, like a pebble stuck yeah. under your wheel, and you just, it just goes flying. Yeah. I mean, you, you get thrown off the board without any notice whatsoever. And I remember that we were, when I was uh, in my teens, before we had a skate park, an indoor skate park, we used to skate in this parking house in, in wintertime. And there was like multiple levels of this parking house, like I think it was four floors or something and the upper two floors was had this super smooth mm. polished concrete so you, we could like uh, and it was like it wasn't super steep hills but a couple of hills inside this parking house with this really smooth concrete so we would like um try to like we had races and stuff right we would race each yeah. other and if you hit a pebble there that would be uh, quite the experience. Yeah, and then so you slam. You slam. Yeah. You slam. But that's a, that's a term. That's a definite term. But we call this. I mean, I don't know what you call these pebbles, but we used to skate in this parking house, which was called Santansfjelle. Okay. Mm. So we would call it Santanstein. Okay. <laughs> Saint Hans Stone. Yeah. <laughs> 
okay. super local uh, jargon. Yeah. And so I guess like for if you've stuck with us this far in all of our uh, technical dissection of skateboarding <laughs> lingo, um, <laughs> basically you're going to see if you're not a skateboarder, a lot of this stuff is already kind of inaccessible and incomprehensible to you. Mm. And, and this is really the downside of jargon. If you're outside of it, you know, the people who are using it are obscuring the meaning and potentially creating some kind of confusion for their audience. And, mm. and so this is definitely a, a problem when using jargon or when encountering jargon as a, a researcher or as a student. And so it's always, I think, about being a bit selective for it. Who's your target audience um, if you're writing? Is this jargon going to be appropriate? Is it a technical term that doesn't necessarily have a plain language equivalent that is short and easy to understand? So mm. in that case, something like conformal cyclic cosmology uh, is probably better than describing exactly what it is. Um, and that technical language ends up being unavoidable because there's no easy equivalent to it. But then I would say you kind of get more into like the style of jargon or what you could call like the pomposity of academic writing. And, and I think that that's a form of jargon and a style of, of writing that could easily be avoided if people paid a bit more attention to it. So, so are you, you were going to say something. I'm just uh, thinking about this conformal cyclic cosmology. Um, and this is just to, I mean, maybe that there are some um, disagreements within that field mm -hmm. on how to define conformal cyclic cosmology. So then you can even run into trouble. Yeah. Uh, using a term like that. Because there might be different in interpretations of what it should be. Or the the inner mechanics of it. I don't know anything about this, but you just uh, hope you get my uh, yeah. And I mean, even my point. even my explanation of it, I've tried to simplify to my own understanding <laughs> uh, for the sake of you know like pop science. And also, I'm not an mm. astrophysicist. I, I just have an interest in the stuff. So, how is it that I would try to explain a very loaded? term like that. So so these loaded terms, technical language and concepts and you know these these terms are predominantly theories in mm. science and in research. So we can't just do away with them. And no. that's where I think it's important that you know we're going to be encountering a lot of jargon as students uh, as researchers in the readings we do and in the writing that we produce. So always thinking about your audience and what they know and to what extent do I need to explain this? And it never hurts to give an explanation of it early on so that you can continuously use that term throughout and people understand what your meaning is. I think that it's uh, very important. That's something that I tell everybody that comes by the writing center, that if you're going to use some kind of specialized term, you need to explain what it is. In the beginning, the first mm -hmm. time you use that term, you need to define it and then you need to explain how you're going to use it. And then the first couple of times, it would be nice with a small little rem reminder because sometimes it could be a lot of different concepts that fly around, you know, get thrown around. So it's uh, it, it can be hard to remember what means what. So just a short reminder a couple of times or at least one time, and then you can stick with the, uh, the term or even an abbreviation. Exactly. Because that happens a lot. I mean, I've read so many different um, term papers in, uh, I mean, m maybe they're trying to describe what happened in the laboratory using some kind of machinery, right? Mm -hmm. And then once one machine has a really long, complicated name uh, and it does something very specific, like it handles, uh, you know, some kind of uh, material, whatever it does. But the, the, the machine has a long, complicated name, so then you need some kind of abbreviation of something that is already a difficult term to understand. Yeah. <laughs> so then th that needs to be explained, so it's uh, easy for the reader to follow. Yeah. And so this is just always, um, it's a judgment call, right? Um, but we, mm -hmm. we have this technical language because the point is, if you make your meaning clear your use of it is going to make your writing and therefore the comprehension for the reader much simpler and much easier to understand than needing to stretch it out to give a much longer plain language equivalent. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, there is that trade-off that, 
you know, at certain levels and certainly within certain um, journals that you might be reading and articles that are published there, there's going to be a higher level of technical language uh, than more of the generalist uh, articles written in generalist journals. So mm. it, it is a judgment call. But what I really wanted to kind of point out here is what, you know, sort of the pompousness that can come with academia, the idea that most academics sit in this ivory tower and a lot of what they write is incomprehensible to anybody but themselves. And I have a real problem with that because I think, you know, what's the real role of, of a university and of a professor and a researcher and an academic is the idea to just kind of insulate yourself and be so insular that you only communicate with your immediate peers or is it that this research should really be you know disseminated and distilled so that it can be looked at and examined and thought of by people who are not your immediate peers that a much broader audience and i th I, I think we we talked about this uh, a little bit the, the, the previous podcast there was something about uh different disciplines working together and, st uh, mm -hmm. and, and i think just Getting rid of this very pompous jargon is important because then it, it will make the content accessible for people from other disciplines. Yes. Uh, and they can bring their perspective into it. I mean, so I feel like you have, uh, to, to at least to a certain extent, some kind of a social responsibility to make what you're working on and what you're writing about uh, as accessible as possible within the... I mean, I, I know that you have to kind of mold whatever you're working on um, so it fits uh, a certain journal or something like that. But I, I think you could still get rid of some of these just very unnecessarily difficult ways of, of describing things. Yeah, and this is where I think that kind of the pompous jargon, if I, if I were to define it so that people would understand what it is I'm really talking about, it is an attempt by an author to intentionally make their writing more difficult to comprehend and understand. Uh, because they're attempting to sound smart. And it's a combination of use of technical words, but also communication styles. Uh, I would say it tends to be wrapped up with a lot of nominalization, a lot of prepositional mm. phrases, a lot of redundancy, uh, and using um, many synonyms uh, to, to describe something in great detail. And very often there's a large amount of interruptions going on within the sentences and paragraph construction. So ultimately... Yeah, yeah, it is. And sometimes it could, it could also be use of words that are very difficult to like pin down what it actually means yes. in the sentence. It's like, it could be the nothing of the nothingness or something like, what does that exactly. mean? Exactly. Like, Even words, pedantic words like the word pedantic. So narrow and specialized that only a small group of people are really going to know what that means. And there are... <laughs> Other words, plain language equivalents that you could substitute with pedantic, you know, narrow, isolated, <laughs> specialized. So why do we do this? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on why we experience this sort of pompous writing or the pompous jargon as more of a communication style than as a technical term? I think it's all about social positioning in a way. I mean, you want to impress your peers, and, and the way to do that is by showing that you know the ins and outs of the subculture that you're a part of. So you will see the same thing in climbing. I mean, um, when we I started out with the example of to jam a fist, and I mean, you don't have to say it like that. You could use a plain language equivalent to just explain what you're going to do. But instead, you use this climbing-specific terminology to show that you're part of the group. Mm-hmm. And I mean, some of, some of them, if you can pick up on these buzzwords within climbing or skateboarding or, or in, within your field, your academic field, it really fast, it sounds like you're, you know, you're modern, you're... Uh, you're hip. <laughs> you're, you're with You're it. super hip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what you're, what, you're hip. Whatever people are, you're fleek. Do people even still use that word? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But at some point, that would be like the the... the the final frontier yeah. in a way. So this sort of pompous jargon, if we want to call it that, would it's not just the use of a technical term, for example. It is the expression, sort of the associated slang that comes with that discipline. Uh, 
And some of them also has a, has a long history. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that the interesting thing is that pompous uh, jargon is all over academia, but especially back in the days. Yeah. It, it, it was, defined academia. Exactly. And it was, and it played an important role. I think it just uh, it was something about separate the academic uh, culture from the unintellectuals. Exactly. Or, to in establish other words, the people that couldn't as uh, exactly. intelligentsia, right? And, and and they tried to position themselves in between the people that could not afford higher education, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was, you know, most people, and then the really, really, really filthy rich people that, in most cases, were uh, generals, kings, queens, stuff like that. Yes. And they, they got there, they had military education in most cases, I think. Yeah. And so we get to a point where what you're saying, there's this long historical tradition to do this. And we've talked about this in some previous episodes before that there's sort of like this identity crisis uh, within academia and at universities because there is this long tradition, which realistically has been about elitism, separating this group of people as the intelligentsia. And this is the role that we play as a higher echelon, an upper level. Uh, And there, you know, I'm using jargon myself. Um, (laughs) uh, This this, this higher rung on the societal ladder, if you will. Um, And that has very much just become a convention that we we tend to do it and we tend to see it because that's how it's always been done. And a lot of people, mm. I've definitely met professors who are really critical of this idea of using plain language equivalents because your job as a researcher and your job as an academic is to struggle with this stuff. And I say, well, <laughs> sure, but you know, there used to be a time where there were maybe, what, like 12 publications in an entire year? that were published and accessible to you. So of course you could take an entire month to read one person's treaty on something and respond to it because there were only what, like a, a, a few dozen, maybe a couple hundred of you, but we have tens of thousands, if, if not probably millions of people who are now achieving much higher levels of education. We don't have that time. And, and so this convention I think is really something that is, much more historical. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it in grammar. You can you can grammatically take this sort of style and use it, but ultimately I feel like this convention has more or less been propped up as a way of still segregating ourselves uh, from like the old school versus the new school, but also in a way to kind of yeah. keep people out that oh well we as this group only want the best of the best we only want the people who have nothing but all the time in the world to dedicate to trying to understand this incomprehensible writing that we're producing just a couple of examples i mean have you ever encountered heidegger yeah or Gadamer, some of the stuff that foucault has been oh, you know, Fou- writing foucault especially <laughs> It could, it can be, and Heidegger, it can be so difficult, so incredibly difficult. You have to use like a, a week to decipher the meaning of like a one chapter or a couple of pages, uh, you know, and looking up a hundred million references to just understand what this is about. And I mean, that could be a, a, an interesting process in itself, but it's very time consuming and I'm, I don't think it's too effective. No. And so, again, I'm not going to say that it's bad that people do that. If that's the communication style that you choose, and it's very much deeply rooted, I would say, more in philosophy than in applied mm. sciences. Um, so Much more. And, and they also invent some of their own terminology, like their own concepts to explain some kind of, uh, yes. you know, let's say a social phenomenon. Or the, the inner mechanics of, of uh, some kind of social phenomenon. Yes, and I think that, that you've hit on a really important point there, that this there is a really big push. Uh, if you're a master's student, if you get into a PhD, if you're doing a postdoc, if you are you know, a full-time researcher, there's a big push to be novel. You need to create something new because that's what gets published. That's what gives you more research funding. You need to prove that you're producing stuff, and that stuff needs to be from a you know objective scientific standpoint novel. It needs to be new. And so Mm. there is also this tendency in certain disciplines to then, oh, well, if I haven't really done anything new or novel, at least I can create a new concept and use Mm. that new concept as something to like add 
to a theory that I have been working with, and that's my new novel creation. So we also see kind of the the creation of coined phrases and buzzwords mm. and sort of the proliferation of a lot of them, and they change, they come and they go so quickly. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've done it myself. Yeah, I think we're uh, all guilty um, of it. Yeah, I've done, I've done it myself. I've been um, combining different theoretic uh, different theories to create like one theoretical framework, and that has created a need for a new concept. Mm-hmm. So I've done it myself, and you think, oh, this is really good, and then you know, you never use it again. Yeah. <laughs> so we just ended up adding complexity in a way. I mean, it would be interesting to just go with the exact opposite direction just try to simplify stuff i don't know if you get any funding but it's <laughs> so i mean i i don't know if there's like a, a right or wrong answer to this it's more of just the observation that this is why it happens and if you want to engage in it i mean by all means go for it because there are a lot of people who will share that perspective but i think you and i take the we take the other side of maybe being you know science is more democratic we sh- we should have knowledge and education be more accessible and more comprehensible to people. At least that's kind of my main standpoint on it. So my whole approach is you you have an op- you have a choice. When it comes to using jargon and when it comes to taking these sorts of communicative styles that are much more pompous and full of jargon, are you doing that because you want to sound intelligent or are you doing that because you want to be understood? And those are two very different things. You can still be understood quite easily at, with quite intelligent ideas that use plain language. Of course. I, I just want to... Um, this is pretty interesting. I, I When I was a student in the University of Oslo, I was uh, studying with a guy called Tony. And he was... Um, he When he finished his master's degree, he went straight into a, a PhD position in in cultural history and I think the project that he started to work on was it was a very interesting project it was all about translating medical terms or or jargon within medicine so the patients would understand their conditions Mm. better so that it's almost like a one thing is cultural uh, translation that you have to take all kinds of cultural conventions into consideration when translating a term, but this is almost like a subcultural translation, just to make this a little bit more difficult to understand. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very interesting project, I think. And I, I was reading some of the stuff that they translated, and they tried to, like, like once again, this is by using uh, plain language equivalents. So, so normal people would understand what was going on inside their bodies, what was wrong. Yeah. And you could also always hear the, the really good doctor uh, tell people, like, uh, try to explain how insulin works or something like that, and they're really good at explaining, like, they they have, like, a... They're, they're pedagogically really good at explaining what they what they're talking about. So they use these analogies and, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, this was, and, and I, I would say this hmm? has been brought up uh, really well in The Simpsons. I can't remember which episode, but uh, Homer is at the doctor's, Dr. Herbert, if anybody is a, a Simpsons fan. Uh, and Dr. Herbert is explaining uh, that Homer is going to end up needing a heart surgery. And he says, okay, well, we're going to need to perform a triple bypass surgery. And Homer says, just give it to me straight, doc. Okay, Mr. Simpson, we need to perform open heart surgery on you. And Homer says, could you dumb it down a notch? And the doctor says, we are going to cut you open and tinker with your ticker. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's basically yeah. what this project was about. Yeah, I could see that because, again, it, it's about who your audience is. Um, what is your intention behind it? Uh, if you're writing purely for medical researchers, yeah, a lot of the jargon is going to make a lot more sense. But... You also need to realize that there are a lot of doctors who are not researchers. 
they may follow up on some of the latest trends in research. Um, mm. You know, they will be continuously doing upgrade training. My mother's a nurse, so she is periodically sending me articles about as she's watching the, the COVID-19 and she sent me something about uh, a possible correlation between vitamin D uptake and uh, immunity or stronger immune systems against COVID-19. Um, but, okay. but she's also not a researcher. She's yeah. a practitioner. She's in the field. And so the types of research that she reads is definitely not the hard laboratory science. It's written in a different way and still filled with a lot of technical terms, obviously. Um, but it's, say, for example, it's much more focused on the results than necessarily on the methodology. So it's not going to include all of these very technical processes, uh, laboratory procedures, so much as a greater focus on what does this mean for treatment? What does this mean for your patients? What does this mean for everything else that you need to consider as a medical professional in practice? Yeah, what, what are you going to practically do? Yeah. I mean... Um, and there are pros and cons. I mean, this this the stuff that she's reading. I don't think it would be too beneficial if it would include a lot of information about the methods, about you know the the super hardcore lab stuff uh, for her as a practitioner. What do you think? Probably not, because of course there are lab technicians at the hospital who would be more interested in that sort of stuff. So and that will and that will. You know, uh, the language will depend on who you speak to. Exactly. And so, therefore, it, it's really about knowing your audience. But I would still say that you you should maybe question some of these kind of jargon as a pompous style of communication mm -hmm. within your own disciplines. Because you always need to ask yourself, you know, is it clear? Is it understandable? Even if it's filled with technical language, is the construction of the ideas done in a way that makes the meaning as easy to understand as possible? Because I think what ends up happening, and this is probably maybe more so in um, the social sciences, but that's also where I'm much more engaged. Um, what I end up seeing is you get a lot of people who, because of jargon and the complexity of the way they're trying to communicate their ideas, they end up having big arguments over something that they actually agree upon. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And some people end up having a career. Yes. You know, that, that's their career. And I might sound super rude right now. But let's just talk about people that don't exist anymore. Uh, because let's go back to Heidegger. He was a German philosopher, and um, he was, in his own time, he was, I wouldn't say attacked, but he was uh, criticized by uh, a German sociologist called Theodor Adorno. And he attacked Heidegger because um, of his writing style, and he called it a sub-language as a superior language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's when it gets a little bit serious. Like, then we're all about the 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 the, the academic up in his ivory tower and uh, creating this uh, super obscure language so nobody knows what you're doing and you can defend your position by using words that nobody understands. So there's something that I find a little bit funny as well because there's, I mean, Michel Foucault and post-structuralism is still very much alive and well. Uh, and I, I encounter a lot of people who are really drawn towards a lot of these ideas. And I mean, personally, I'm not sure why, because it just seems like critical thinking with a very fancy hat and a difficult name to pronounce. Um, but, <laughs> but what I really like about it, maybe not a lot of people know, is that by Foucault's own admission, he has said, and, and this is him speaking as part of the French academic culture, um, you know, he has admitted to saying in France, you got to have 10%, uh, you got to have at least 10% incomprehensibility. Otherwise, people aren't going to think that it's deep, and then they won't think that you're a profound thinker. So there's, you, you also... <laughs> He's actually said that? Yeah. And so you have to be aware that m maybe a lot of the the kind of theory, uh, or the theorists and, and uh, philosophers within your discipline as well are kind of keeping up with this idea that a lot of it is about putting up a front, an illusion to sound smarter than you really are. And 
what I find really difficult with that is that, you know, you can have really smart ideas, but you don't need to write 27 pages to necessarily explain it. But there's a tendency to want to do that because, oh, it's so much more impressive. Look at how much this person writes. Oh, wow, you really have to commit yourself to getting in there and reading it. It's like, well, no, like you read the abstract, you read the introduction, you read the conclusion. All the main points, if they're a good writer, will be in there. So you don't need these mm-hmm. necessarily these 27 pages. The, the main core ideas should be prevalent in those three sections. And if you can't pull any meaning out of those three sections it's kind of unlikely that you're going to pull out more meaning from everything else that's included in there. Probably not because then it goes like really into detail. And I mean, it's a lot of times it's a lot harder to really distill an idea down and and make it super clear and really easy. That's also can be very difficult. I I think for some people, it's a lot easier to just write these super complex, long sentences with a lot of like, weird positioning and and all kinds of different stuff. Mm -hmm. It it definitely is. And I think maybe part of that too is that people are still trying to work the idea and unfurl it and polish it in that Mm. process of writing. And then they never really go back to to tidy it up or they they kind of end up thinking, oh, well, I've said it as clearly as I can say it. And I think that... But do... I think that that mentality is like, well... No, that's kind of just being a bit lazy. If if you apply the principles of writing that we work with at the Writing Center, there's actually a lot that you can do to improve the clarity and, you know, make this a bit more concise. And you can still keep your really big ideas. You can still keep the deep meaning that you have in here. But it is going to take a little bit of work to change the style of communication. Definitely. But this is just a question from me to you, in a way. I mean... Uh, do you feel like excessive use of jargon is is more normal for non-native English speakers? No, because they kind of want to just follow a tradition or something. Sound smart, sound like they they can master the language. No, I I don't believe so at all because I know okay. you know Canadians, uh, Americans, uh, Britons, uh, Scots who they can use this pompous jargon, and mm. and they think that they should have a, maybe a better. Uh, handle of it. So, well, I can use it because I know how to use it correctly. But Mm. here's another thing that comes up that you also need to consider for people working in a second language. Sometimes it's easier for them, especially people coming from romance languages where you're already connecting things together in a series of prepositional phrases. Um, Mm. So French and and Spanish uh, and Portuguese, uh, Italian, for example, the way that you describe things is established in the context of prepositional phrases. So relating to things with words like of and by and to and for, uh, these words that demonstrate relations between objects or relationships between people and things. So, no, I, I think that you also can have a tendency to take this sort of language when you come from linguistic backgrounds where that's a part of your daily form of communication. Oh, oh, sure, yeah. sure. Of course, there there are some cultural differences there. I, I I can imagine, but it seems like like just when it comes to writing, very complex. Uh, it's it's more a personal thing, mm-hmm. I guess. More about personality. But you do hint, you um, hint on something that I think is really important too. That we tend to replicate what we're most exposed to. So think about mm. um, yeah. Let's say climbing. Think about some of the people that you climb with. Uh, on something of a regular basis, don't you see that you start to copy some of their moves and you can maybe start seeing the wall the way that they see it and, you know, you it, it becomes easier to communicate together because you're kind of both, um, like, adapting to each other and kind of changing your style because of more or less the room you're in, for lack of a better word. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And, and just uh, another example, I remember as a kid... Um, I was just I can I can remember I came home from one of my friends at like in the evening and my mother was like stop acting like your friend. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we we don't <laughs> even think about this stuff. It, we, <laughs> humans are just kind of sponges, you know? It's so easy yeah. for us to pick up what we're exposed to and that's why if you try to read a lot of people who are writing reviews and critiques and exposés of um, post-structuralism and Michel Foucault's writing, they tend to write exactly like Michel Foucault. 
<laughs> and it does because they want to emulate. Well, that. yeah, they, and that, that, he's the, they look up he's to the main, that person. Guy. And you absorb so much of it that it's hard to kind of think differently when that's been the form of communication that you've been taking in. And it's very strange to see stuff like that happen in very small communities or subcultures. So climbing is a good example because it's very small. Like there's probably one or two people between me and one of the most famous climbers in the world. Mm-hmm. Like imagine that yeah. if you're a football player or you're into music, there is usually a, bit of a, a pretty <laughs> a big distance between me and Kanye West, for example. Or in politics, for that matter, yeah. between uh, some guy running for office in his, uh, you know, small town in, in Canada or Norway and, and Donald Trump. Like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people between between these two guys. Um, but in climbing, not so much. So you can hear that one guy is, is starting to use some kind of a word for something, like a like slang, like a new slang yeah. word that some some person invents or just, in most cases, just hijacks from another subculture. And then suddenly you can hear all these pros use that mm-hmm. word in their Instagram videos just, just a couple of days yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> and, and because of the technology that we have, you know, a lot of this new jargon can spread very quickly. And that's where we get more or less, you know, the, kind of the accumulation of buzzwords uh, in mm. science and technology and, and education and research. And these buzzwords change so quickly because everybody is trying to define it in their own way and give it its own meaning and it creates its own subgroup of, of jargon and, and kind of the stylistic jargon that comes from the discipline. So realistically... And also because if, if one important person yeah. uh, is using this word or someone that has a... You know, a high position in that. Exactly, uh, which is why people who are really into Heidegger or Foucault or Nietzsche will probably tend towards that kind of style in their writing and communication. Uh, and people who are maybe <clears throat> more into um, Zinger or uh, Chomsky will kind of take a, a very different approach to it. And some will talk about discourses and some will talk about something else. Yeah. You know, I just, I think I, um, one of my former colleagues sent me this article from, he's a, He's a philosopher, and he, he's he's an old man, but he's uh, he's still pretty active, uh, as uh, a lot of philosophers are, you know, until they're in their nineties. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, he's been coming up with this concept. He calls it an event, and of course, his understanding of the term is completely different from how we use it in in when we normally talk about an event. Oh, totally. Yeah, of course it is. Well, so he used an already existing word and just made just came up with a completely different meaning yeah Uh, and and it's all about like these kind of cultural and social events that just suddenly occur but no one could base no one could uh foresee them coming no and that also ends up coming down to as i had said before this sort of push that everybody needs to be so new and novel and we need to create so much in this course that I've been taking, there's such a pressure in a lot of research to produce new research that we don't end up seeing replication happen that much anymore. Um, A research team will conduct an experiment multiple times, but it's actually becoming more and more rare for other research teams to attempt to replicate that research and kind of verify it. Because there's so many different projects going on at the same time? Or... Well, just there's no there's no point in doing something that someone else has already done. Oh, because of um, well, that that is that could be problematic, right? Yeah, I mean that's a whole other different argument that maybe we could talk about that in another episode. Mm. But the point being that because there's so much of a drive to produce new stuff, of course, um, in in fields where you might not be producing new scientific like hard science findings, air quotes around that. Um, the tendency is maybe more towards creating new terminology. Do you remember creating new words, right? Do you remember the workshop you had over at the spa uh, in in the winter? Yeah. You remember? You know this guy. He was talking about how to uh, how to get funding. Mm-hmm. The process of of and it's all about. It's not all about, but a large part of it is. Um, being able to sell your project. Yeah. 
what's new and what's novel about it what's new what's hip and and you know the use of funny words to catch their attention and, and yeah. stuff like that so hmm. so in a way a lot of this jargon has just kind of become a part of the research culture that we should also be aware of but it's kind of like a marketing um, now, tool in a way yeah yeah so now I'm, i just realized now that we're um we're closing in on an hour here and it's been a lot of more like abstract talk about this so if you've made it this far we're actually going to come down and give you a real <laughs> real life example of how to spot jargon and and maybe discuss some of the the tools that can help you out if you find it hard okay now give it give I us, give us the uh, the example yeah i could pull up hundreds of articles from many many different disciplines billions of billions um, of now <laughs> <clears throat> there's there's no shortage but the one that I really like to use is I like to use it because it's a bit close to me I did my master's research and incorporated uh, one of these theories as part of an explanation for my results it's an article from 2001 by a, an author called David Snow and the title is called and we're just going to even look at the title for right now to demonstrate this is the sort of pompous jargon in writing and how you can spot it mm. The title is Extending and Broadening Balmer's Conceptualization of Symbolic Interactionism. Okay. Um, you know what? That's a, a lot of fancy $20 words in there. Well, first first off, um, I'm not really sure what he means with conceptualizing symbolic interactionism. Yeah. What does that mean in this context? Exactly. So if you're not familiar, if you're not in then you don't know that symbolic interactionism is a theory produced by, I believe it was Herbert. Okay. Uh, someone might correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to say Herbert Bulmer. Uh, and it's this idea that people interact, it's a social constructivist viewpoint, that people interact with other people and objects and actions and events that happen in their world, and we create symbolic representations of them. Okay. And it's that use of symbols that helps to inform kind of the proper and improper ways of behaving. So, yeah, we have kind of a technical term because it's a theory, symbolic interactionism. It's very loaded. So, so just to, so it's about, we create the symbols about ourselves or about things, objects. And about the world every, and everything. the way that we interact with okay, it. Okay, yeah. so it's all about how we quantify reality and how all these different little quant, this these things that we create, these um, these small definitions of things, how mm -hmm. they are defined in a specific way and how they interact with each other to create yeah. and some kind of understanding of our environment. Exactly. And it works very well to explain what happens when you have differences or disagreements uh, to the same symbol. Well, you can look at kind of the culture of a person, mm. uh, the group that they come from, the education that they have, the worldview that they have, and you can kind of understand that their interaction with this symbol is going to very likely be quite different than someone who comes from a different cultural, educational uh, uh, background. And when we talk um, about the symbols, we are, in a way, talking about language, right? Yeah. In most cases, I mean, just the, the, the word tree... It doesn't matter which, lang which language you use. The, 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 in, the internal image, the image you get in your head of a tree will probably differ uh, depending mm -hmm. on the culture you're from. Yeah, exactly. So symbolic interactionism is a theory. And so it's kind of a technical term that we can't avoid using. But the rest of this title, we can really break it down and look at the ideas of uh, clarity and concision and realize that, well... The first part... It's all... The, the, just the title, you know, extending and broadening. Well, I know the meaning those, of these words, but aren't they kind of synonymous with each other? Don't they have it's a the very same, similar isn't it? meaning? More or less. To extend means to make something larger, yeah. to include more things within it. And, and broaden means to make something wider. Yeah, to and, include and more that things kind of is, is, <laughs> is to make something larger. Yeah. So here is one. I guess. area where you see this kind of use of redundancy and repetition as a way of building up this like very self-important language that sounds incredibly intelligent. But we realistically could just choose one or two of these terms. So then maybe extending to, would be better. Yeah. And then we come to the, the nominalization, 
conceptualization. Yeah. So a nominalization is when you take a verb, an action word, in this case, to conceptualize, and you turn it into a noun, a, an object, a person, a place, or a thing. But uh, just a question here. Is uh, symbolic interactionism, is it Bloomer who um, created this theory? Yes. Blooms? Okay, so then you could just write extending Bloom's symbolic interactionism. Exactly. You could easily do that. Because his because conceptualization just seems unnecessary to, you, to, yeah, to, to include. It, Exactly. It's already a concept. Symbolic interactionism is a concept, so you don't necessarily need to say it's a conceptualization. Uh, just including um, Bulmer's name is more than enough, and or Bloomer's uh, name. Sorry, I've probably been <laughs> mispronouncing that. Blue, so when we, but, but the interesting thing here is, is it even correct? I'm not even sure. Like, if he is the uh, the father of the theory. Could you say that it's his conceptualization? I mean, isn't that yeah, a little like off? You, you get into a whole other debate because this is David Snow's extension and broadened conceptualization of Bulmer's symbolic interactionism. It is. Yeah. So <laughs> you see how you can kind of go in and, and break a lot of this stuff down, but it sounds very impressive. It's extending and broadening... Bloomer's conceptualization of symbolic interactionism. Well, realistically, you could create this to be much clearer, much shorter, much simpler by kind of removing the nominalization. We have a prepositional phrase, the conceptualization of symbolic interactionism. They're using that preposition of. So we have a couple options here. The first clear one could be we simply say extending Bulmer's symbolic interactionism concept. Mm. Okay, now I know what this article is actually going to be about. Or just extending on Bloom's theory of symbolic interactionism. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, why not even go a bit further? What is the real noun that we're doing here? Or, sorry, not the noun. What is the real verb that we want to use here? I mean, isn't it to conceptualize? Mm -hmm. Because, and, well, what happens if we reconceptualize hmm. Bloom's symbolic interactionism? Well, that would already incorporate these ideas of if we're reconceptualizing it, we're probably changing the way. And that might be an expansion. That might be a redirection. It might be a widening of the term. It can already encapsulate the terms extending and Yeah, broadening. so you could just start out with reconceptualizing Bloom's symbolic interactionism. Exactly. Mm. So here, let me, let me give you... Uh, the f I, I really love this article just for the introductory sentence. When confronted with the challenge of articulating the core premises of symbolic interactionism, scholars generally refer, almost in the fashion of liturgical recitation, to Herbert Bloomer's conceptual distillation of the perspective into three core principles. One, that people act towards things, including each other, on the basis of the meanings they have for them. Two, that these meanings are derived through social interaction with others. And three, that these meanings are managed and transformed through an interpretive process that people use to make sense of and handle the objects that constitute their social worlds. Okay. Um, okay, well, I so one good thing, on. he's, he's, he's explaining <laughs> what symbolic interactionism is. That's quite good. But yeah. holy hell, that is a lot to try to get through. And that's the first sentence. It is. It is. I, but I believe that there's only three, maybe four sentences in the first paragraph. And that first paragraph takes up half a page. Wow. Yeah. So that's a pretty clear indication that this is like excessive amounts of pomposity in this writing. And you're probably going to struggle through it to understand what the hell this person is trying to say. The problem for me is that I'm so used to reading stuff like this that you kind of just get... I mean, you get better at it with practice and you get used to what these different words mean in, in different contexts. But but still, I mean, but I'm, I'm still kind of just hooked up on the Bloomer's conceptualization of his own theory. I mean, that, that just sounds mm -hmm. really strange to me. I would never, never write it that way. In Norwegian, if you would translate this to Norwegian, it would just be a catastrophe. Yeah. <laughs> it would just... So, like, this is the thing, you know, in... In an effort to try to sound really smart and to be kind of a gatekeeper, uh, that you have to be at this level of education and to be so into this specific sociological discipline and, and school of thought. Mm. Um, if not, this article isn't for you. 
<laughs> well, you know, what was really problematic about it is that, well, this is like one of the highly cited articles. So I wanted to go and read it when I was trying to learn about symbolic interactions. Sure. And you have to struggle through it. And it's not easy. You know, yes, you can become more accustomed to it. You can maybe become a bit desensitized to it. But when I see this stuff, I really kind of, I really kind of hate it because <laughs> you could, you could say it so much more clearly. Yeah, yeah, you can. It's you know, unnecessary. You could, sim you could simply say that scholars are often confronted with clarifying or defining the core ideas of symbolic interactionism. Mm. Symbolic interactionism was developed by Herbert Balmer in 1969 uh, and contains three core principles. A lot of the rest of that stuff is just nonsense that we don't need. When, when you break this apart, full of nominalization, Mm. Full of prepositional phrases. There is a lot of passive voice going on. There's no real action. Uh, so it's very hard to see what any relationship or kind of movement in the sentence is. It's also full of a lot of unnecessary information and tangential information that just interrupts the flow of thought. I... This idea that scholars generally refer almost in the fashion of liturgical recitation. Once again, back to when I was um, teaching pedagogy, I would always kind of, I would advise the students to, if they're going to use some kind of theory, kind of try to stay away from that way of, of explaining or writing. Because these different theoretical, or these different theories that you might want to use as a framework for your uh, research or your analysis, um, it's a tool. So try to be as straightforward as possible because this mm -hmm. will get difficult anyways. Uh, so it's all about, once again, uh, active voice is the best way, the, the best tool to properly explain how to use a tool, you know? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I mean, the Writing Center's got great resources on this through our canvas swr 100 resource portal and our youtube page where we're trying to keep that updated with more and more information as we have the time but there's a lot of other great tools that you can use oh, yeah. i mean one just kind of learn what nominalization and prepositional phrases and passive voice are and there's a lot of great resources out there and you can also use things like the writer's diet test which we have videos on and we've talked about before or the gunning fog index and these are free tools that you can just copy and paste sections of text in and it'll kind of give you a calculation on how difficult it is to understand we could include um like a link to the writer's diet test video. yes and and the gunning yeah exactly we can do that how to use it and and some good things like that and what's great about it is it's not only useful for you when you're reading because we are going to encounter a lot of difficult and very often incomprehensible writing because of these types of academic conventions mm. The writer's diet test is a great way to help you understand why it's difficult for you. And the Gunning Fog Index looks at uh, multi-syllable words and I believe how many words you have in relation to major punctuation points. Mm. And it kind of gives a, a count of like how many formal years of education you would need to be able to comprehend that writing. But so these are really good tools to to plug this reading into and try to figure out, oh, okay, no, it's not just me. I'm not just having a hard time understanding this. It's actually the author has intentionally made it difficult mm. to understand their bright ideas. I think th these, like the Writer's Diet Test and Gunning Fog Index and also some of the resources that we have on Canvas uh, is very useful. But I also think that just keeping, try to think about the, the history of your discipline Try to think about why um, why do academics speak like they do? There is a historic reason that we just we've been talking a little bit about it and the, and the culture. But you should also think about um, what is the purpose of this language. Like, it obviously depends on the audience. So mm -hmm. that's something that you should keep in mind. Do you write this for your professor, for other students? Uh, are you going to publish it? Who may, how, how many or who many people do you want to reach out to? There's a lot of different things that you need to take into consideration. Um, but I think that's kind of the... Is there anything else that you think we should add? 
I mean, you're going to encounter this stuff as well. I, another tool I would say is if you're having difficulty understanding, have a thesaurus with you. Mm. Thesaurus.com yeah, yeah. is a really a... great resource. And type in these words that you don't understand because similar words, synonyms, will be presented and you'll suddenly realize, oh, this person, instead of saying liturgical recitation, could have said they recite. Exactly. There is, you know, they they directly quote. There is a, a plain language <laughs> equivalent in in yes. most cases for most of this mm. stuff. Yeah, and and so thesaurus.com. I'll link it in the show description as well. A really great tool. And ultimately, it it comes down to yeah, you're going to get a lot of exposure to this in academia in in almost every discipline. Um, the biggest shift I have seen has really been in the natural sciences towards more plain language. Um, but if you go back to the, the 1970s, uh, the 1980s, their writing is also filled with pompous jargon. And, and what happens if you're, let's say that you're a master's student and your supervisor thinks that your writing is, um, for lack of a better word, childish? Mm -hmm. If it's too direct, if it's too clear, because this person is a part of this old culture, what do you do? Um, Oh, I would say, okay, well, can you tell me which parts you didn't understand? Hmm. Because for me, that's what the ultimate choice is going to be. You can write like David Snow. Uh, you can sound incredibly intelligent through complex sentence construction and interrupting your stream of thought and forcing the reader to have to dissect your work for hours and hours at a time. Or you can really work to be understood. And if someone is saying that, well, you're writing it, it's so simple a child could understand it. And then you can just say, well, that's because I understand this well enough that I could explain it in a way. I think that's a good, that even a child could understand. That's it. a very good argument. And you could also say like, okay, so do you feel like my way of explaining this have taken away some of its nuance? Uh, no, no. What, when, then what is the problem? Mm -hmm. If it explains what it's supposed to explain as well as it can, then that yeah. that's the most important part, I think. And Exactly. What is the benefit of trying to complicate it if there's nothing in there that you misunderstand? And it might also be that this professor is trying to defend their own position and their own job. Yeah. Who knows? Exactly. And there definitely are people like that. Um, but you, they're, I think, also easy to understand because when you try to have a conversation with them, it's very difficult. They don't have the, the red thread, as you always say in Norwegian. Mm. They interrupt themselves. They go off on tangents. They have a hard time holding focus. They talk in circles. Um, these people <laughs> tend, because they've been living inside of that bubble for so long, they, they tend to speak the way that they write. And so it is very often just a reflection that you're not doing it the way that I think it should be done. And, I, and again, and that's, I, also I, I would just end up with saying that it, it's always a choice. I'm not telling you that you need to do it the way that I've been explaining it. I'm just telling you the benefits that would happen if you choose to do it. I mean, if you want to dive in and be, you know, more of a, a philosophical writer and write in abstract ways, go for it. That's, that is your modus operandi. Uh, it's all on you. And there's a lot of people who make really good careers out of that too. So, but you, but you could definitely <laughs> be very philosophical, but you could still uh, be writing in a very clear fashion. I think you don't have yes. to be super obscure. Uh, no. And I, so I also think that if you take the stuff that we've been talking about now into consideration, it's going to be all right. Great, then we'll, we'll see everybody next week. See you next week. Thanks for a good conversation, Clayton.